steps over there. Okay, so today we're going to talk about estate planning, and we're going to do this a little differently because I am going to ask you questions and see if you if you have the capability to type them into the chat box so I can kind of um, see some of your reaction. I'm in the Department of Ag and Resource Economics, but I am also work with the AgLaw Education Initiative. It's a collaboration between the Cary School of Law at University of Maryland, Baltimore, the College of Ag and Natural Resources at University of Maryland College Park, where I'm at, and then there's um, um, also included in this is the School of Ag and Natural Sciences at UMES. We're funded by Empowering the State. We're a signature program with University of Maryland Extension. Our contact stuff is on the right-hand side of the screen, so you can um, go to the website, find more information on estate planning and other issues there. And this is a little bit about Empower. You have copies of my slides, so I'm not going to read this to you verbatim today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of, you know, I use this a lot when I do estate planning. But I want you to think about what's the typical farm family. And my ages may be off a little bit on this. But granddad's 98 years old. No one really knows what he does in the operation anymore. Grandma's 63 or 93, she manages the day-to-day -day portions of the operation and she may still be, and she is still heavily involved today. Um, Dad's next in line, he's 71. He's never had control of the operation. Does dad really want control of the operation? Does dad actually want to manage this farm? Does dad actually wanna to have to make the management decisions? At 71, he's never had to make those decisions. Is that something he wants to step into? at 71, or is this something that he wants to, you know, just retire and go off and do something else? And then we have son who's about 37. He's eventually gonna take control from dad at some point. Is it better to skip dad at that point and have dad take over um, or have son take over and just bypass dad? Is son in a better position to where he's younger and younger in life than dad? and may want those management decisions at that point. So does that sound like a farm family to you? Is it not? It's also the English royal family. And we have to think about this in a way, as we look at a lot of the issues that we're gonna deal with in farm succession planning, You know, we have to think about this in some way. These, it may sound weird, but these are a lot of the issues that could be faced. We may have grandparents involved in the operation who still want to be actively involved in some way. And we may have a second generation who's never had control. Do they want to be in control at that point? Has anyone ever next generation to figure out what they want and what does the son actually want? What does grandson actually want in all of this? You know, we have to think about this and we have to take into account all of this in some way way, and I have to give credit to Shannon Farrell at Oklahoma State because I basically blatantly stole this idea from him and apparently I forgot to put my credit in there. But the other thing we need to think about in all this too is what's the difference between a farm family and the English royal family? Well, the English royal family, how power is passed on is passed on by the succession to the Crown Act of 2013. We know who the heir to the crown is. How does this work in a typical farm family situation? A lot of crickets chirping. You could hear them on your end, but there's crickets chirping because it's not that easy. Yeah, there's a law lined out to do this and we're not really gonna hit on intestacy law today because that's really not the point. We're gonna look at people who have actually done estate plans and think about how to do this in a different way and how their mistakes can benefit us. But, you know, if we don't want to fall under intestacy law where it's automatically decided, you know, we want everything equally divided amongst our children, that's probably not the route we want to go because we're going to talk about equal today. Equal is not always equitable. Equal may end up killing the farm because we didn't do the hard part early on. To think about how to divide the farm up in some way. So let's talk a little bit about developing an estate plan. And if you have questions, please. Type them in the chat box. I can see the chat box. I'm periodically looking at it and I can try to answer them as we go along. So to develop the estate plan, what do we have to do? Well, we need to start thinking about, are there minor children involved in this? 
Now we may be dealing with people that are grandparents or older who may not have, you know, may not have minor children in their lives, but because of circumstances, they may end up becoming the guardian of minor children. Do we now need to start thinking about how to manage those children and what's best for those children and who's the most responsible party to take those on? This is something we need to think about early on. I often point out everybody has that family member they don't want in charge of their children. Maybe we need to think about how who that person is that we actually do want raising that child and um, teaching them as they grow up. Designation of beneficiaries, you know, we have life insurance, we may have payable on death accounts that we're going to talk about here in a minute. That's already going to be lined out. We need to think about how that's done and what's already being done there and bring that into the picture so we can start looking at it. We're going to have to deal with powers of attorney. We're going to have to look at a business power of attorney and a healthcare proxy. The other part of this is we look at doing a will and advanced healthcare directive. The will is something everybody automatically already thinks about and is the main estate planning tool, but it's not just the main estate planning tool. It may be a part of it. It may dictate how property is going to be distributed, but we also have to look at other things like what do we want done at end of life? These are things we need to deal with and think about early on, and I don't think I have a slide in here, but why do you want to deal with, you know, how do you want your health care treated? We're dealing with a pandemic right now. Um, you know, if you're put on life support, how do you want that handled? If you're put on a ventilator, how do you want that handled? These are things you want to think about early on because if you deal with them early on, your family members don't want to have to deal with them. You've made the decision for them and who in your family always makes the right decision in most situations. You probably think you're that person that always makes the right decision. So in this case, you can at least make the right decision for yourself and do what you think is best in your situation. So that's why we're looking at that. Business, we want somebody in there who can make business decisions for us. What kid do you trust? If you have a kid that's gotten in trouble for embezzlement, and making bad financial decisions, do you want them managing the checkbook for the farm? Probably not, um, unless they reformed and changed, but that may not be the situation you wanna put them in. It may not be the best situation for everybody on the farm. And then the other thing we need to think about is what about a trust? We may want to do that. We may also want a business entity instead of a trust that can sort of do the same thing. So these are things we may want to think about. And then is there life insurance policy? Why do I highlight life insurance policies in here? Well, if the bulk of the assets is in the farm, do we need to start thinking early on? If I go back to my um, typical farm family, when do we need to think about you know life insurance? or distributing among heirs. Do we want to think about it when we're in our 90s or do we want to think about it when we're in our 30s? It may be something just money-wise we need to think about in our 30s. Um, and that's something we need to take into account and how to deal with that and something we should early plan for. Other tools, I mentioned business entities may be in there as well. We'll talk about those here in a minute um, with the example I have kind of put together. Um, we may want to look at long-term leases. If we got a business entity or a trust set up and we have one year who's farming, we may want the trust to lease the land long-term to that kid that's farming to tie the land up so it can potentially be farmed for the long-term. If we're dealing with a business entity, that's probably going to be a little bit better. We can use multiple business entities, still give, let kids be a part of the farm because there may not be enough assets to make it fair to everyone. And it may keep children happy to feel like they're a part of the farm, but that's something where we need to talk to them and understand what they want. And as I always point out, we're going to talk about goals here in a second, I believe, but the goals that you develop are very important to this situation because they're going to dictate to you what you end up doing and how this plan's all going to come together. There is not a one-size-fits-all estate plan. Estate planning is a lot of coming up with what works for your situation, your goals, and everyone who's going to be a part of the plan's goals. If we use my English royal family example from the first slide, how many people do we have to bring into that, potentially? Well, if we look at the count on my slide, there was four people involved at that point. Do we need to bring other spouses involved at that point? Do we need to bring other children in? Probably. We should probably bring in Prince Harry. We should probably bring in 
other heirs to start thinking about how do, how do we make this work for the entire family and what's going to keep people to where they want to talk to each other down the road. This is not done in a bubble. Communication with family members, as I just said, and other stakeholders is key. Sit down and start thinking about what our goals are. And others need to think about what their goals are too at the same time. This is not just about you, it's not just about them, but we need to figure out what everybody's goals are. If one kid's goal is to manage the farm someday, okay, we know that now. And if somebody's goal is to potentially just want a piece of the pie, of money or something else, out of the farm, that's fine, that's a goal. But what is everybody's long-term goals? How can we make you know, this business asset, but also a personal asset work for the long term to keep maybe one heir that's been working on the farm for years going and um, continuing in agriculture without making it harder on them. Works if I hit the right button to go the right way. We need to listen to what other family members are saying and how do our goals work together. I've already said this, but we need to make sure we're thinking about this and making sure everything is working together. Yes, you actually do have to listen to your children, but they should also have to listen to you because our goals are probably not all going to be the same. They're going to be different at times, and we need to think about that. And on the next slide, I have an example of this. So hopefully this shows up big enough on whatever screen you're viewing this on from computer to iPad to phone. But this was a question asked on Reddit. If anybody knows what Reddit is, um, this I decided to go to Reddit to ask about her husband's disturbing request for when he passes away. Um, he's had some medical problems and his end of life decision is, as you can read it, is what he wants done with his body is he wants his body clean, his head removed um, his and cleaned and his skull put on the mantle and his body crushed down to two blue gems. And he would like his head to be passed down for generations and generations to come. His wife consistently points out in all of this to her husband that what happens down the road when, you know, this is just some weird family heirloom that gets sold at a thrift store. What, what do we do then? Have you thought this far into the future? He doesn't want to think about that at any point. He wants to do his plan because he finds it to be a good way to deal with death. His wife has a point, maybe they should be sitting down and thinking about, okay, you want to do this, but is this actually the best solution for you in the long run? Well, let's not even talk about that this is highly illegal and something you can't even do, but it is something that's out there that we need to think about this. And it is what we're trying to do and what is our plan sort of like this. We have this really great idea, but everyone else is pointing out flaws in our really great idea. Should we start thinking about how to do this situation better and deal with it in a better way? So now we're to the case study and I'm going to try this. This is the first time I've ever tried this via WebEx. So we're going to try this to see how you guys are doing this. Um, now, if you can find the chat box, you may have to click up at the top if it's sharing the screen and it'll drop down a box and you can click on chat and it'll pop up the chat box. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you guys to sort of type in every now and again um, to give me some thoughts as to what you think is going to happen. And this is actually based on a real case. Um, it wasn't in Maryland. It was out of somewhere else. I, I, think it, I think it was out of Minnesota or Wisconsin. I can't remember exactly. But I call this one giving it away equally, and with the video that will be available at the end, I provided Shannon with a case study so you could sit down and kind of look at it and think about some of the questions I'm going to ask. We're going to do an abbreviated version of this. We have Henry and Alice. They started a dairy farm in 1948, and the farm grows to about 420 acres. Henry and Alice have three children. Two move off the farm, but one returns with her husband and children. We'll talk about that more in a second. In 1995, Henry and Alice develop an estate plan. They create a revocable trust with three kids that will eventually share equally in the farm. That 
this point, they have no kids returning. They have no kids on the farm. Nobody. This plan potentially makes sense in some way. Um, in 1997, one of the children and her husband moved back to the farm to continue to help the farm continue, continue on at that point. Henry and Alice make no changes to their estate plan after that one child moved back. 2004, this farm kid, I'm going to refer to them moving forward. It's a daughter. Um, farm kid purchases the herd, built a small house on the farmland, and enters into long-term leases with Henry and Alice. Now, take a moment, think about this, type in the chat box. Um, you know, if you're a farm kid, what do you want Henry and Alice to do in 2004? What should Henry and Alice be considering doing in 2004 at this point? Okay, seeing some answers. I think most, oh no. Some of you can't. You would want the farm either will to you. You would want to become the owner, a transfer on death, the a transfer of deed, sell the farm to farm kid. We're seeing some answers. Become the owner. So everybody's basically pointing out what I would be thinking if I'm in farm kid situation. It seems like most of us would want to do the same thing. We want to make sure that if we're taking this over and we're building our lives around it, we get the farmland, right? I think that's just human nature, except the problem is sometimes we don't want to talk about this. We don't want to say, you know, we don't want to bring up to mom and dad, hey, how's your estate plan going? What's in the estate plan? It's not something we may feel comfortable asking our parents or our grandparents or a close family member. It's not typical conversation we bring up. So. Part of this is we have to think about how to get around that hang up we may have just because it's to us a taboo subject. And we're now actually pointing out that someone can die. But we need to think about it because this actually does impact our lives if we're that farm kid. We're not, I don't think I have a slide on this. Actually, I know I don't because I didn't create one. But, you know, this is a huge problem where we have these kids who take over the farm and what I'm about to get into sort of creates this issue as to. How does this do? So nothing happens at that point. 2009, Henry passes away and Alice is left in charge of the trust. She still made no changes to any of her estate plan. 2012 rolls around, Alice has passed away and the three kids become trustee of the trust. Does anybody want to type in the chat box what they think happens next? Anyone have any thoughts on what happens next? I see a lot of fighting being mentioned. Yeah, pretty much a lot of fighting. And it's only fighting from one child. I'll talk about this. One of the non farm heirs, in fact, the only son of the group, pushes that he wants his fair share. He wants his fair share of mom and dad's estate. Probably not all too uncommon. We all think, you know, we're all entitled to our share and we want our third. Um, now, if each child's awarded one third of this, and I need to point out the other child never really wanted their fair share. They were more than content to continue to lease the property to the one child and um, continue, continue, let the farm continue. They were not as gung-ho as this one child was. The issue is, is it doesn't matter if two thirds really want the property to be held together. This is now property held, you know, by three people and one person can push for their 
undivided share. When we look at property ownership, property ownership often happens um, where if it's not titled a certain way, it's held equally by all the heirs. So one heir can push for that property to be distributed among the heirs. If we're looking at land, how do we value land, divide land equally, you know, the land's got a house on it, other structures, it may be worth more than just the plain farmland by itself. So it's really hard to figure out at that point what one heir should get equally and what one heir is equally entitled to. So because of that, courts will typically look at selling the property to divide it up and just divide the money up equally because it's easier to divide money up equally than actually figure out how to divide land up. And courts really aren't lazy. They want to look for a solution that's fair. And this is the fair solution they can come up to that works the easiest. Um, from what I remember, there's a question in the chat box where there are provisions for divided or undivided interest. If my memory serves me right, from the case that they were all undivided interest since it was in a trust. And that's the other kicker in this is it's a trust. So it sort of has some other layers of complications. So, so one heir pushes for all for the farm to be sold at fair market value. If you're the farm heir, think about this for a second. I'll have you type some answers in. Did you go to the bank and get you have collateral that a bank would loan you money to purchase 420 acres at fair market value potentially. And side question to that is, do you really want to purchase 420 acres for a dairy farm? Somebody points out maybe if there's a conservation easement. I do not believe there was a conservation easement on this property, so that may have been one way to potentially come up with the, the way to do it. Yeah, you wouldn't have it. The trust would have it, whoever said it. Most of this is going to lie in the trust. You have nothing at this point. Um, really, you're going to purchase collateral, but you know they may want something more than just you purchasing collateral to loan you money. And this was about 2012 with a dairy farm. Would you have wanted a dairy farm in 2012? Change it to today. Would you want a dairy farm today? May probably not. This would be really hard to make work properly. Now, if we just take it and you say, look, I just want 400, 140 acres, my share. Yeah, somebody pointed out I probably screwed my math up at some point. Um, I'll fix that. Um, yeah, so would you have enough, let's go with what I have. Do you have enough farmland to operate the dairy on 140 acres? Probably not at that point. You probably don't. I, I didn't put the, the details are in the written document. You can look at it. One farm was the hay patch, another farm, I believe they did corn on, and then one was one piece was the main pasture that they used. So there was a whole lot to this operation. So if you take away a part of that, you wouldn't actually have enough to continue the farm operating. This is not an uncommon problem. This is consistently a problem we see in a lot of estate plans where nobody ever really wanted to think about how to do this fairly. They did it equally and equal is not always fair this is a hundred percent equal fine that's what you want to do that's fine but what we've now done is we've now cheated the one person who's tied their entire life up to building the farm and building a business there and taking that away from them to where they have to go find something else we're dealing with that today with people being laid off you know how do people feel when that happens this would be laying a person off from their job people do handle it differently creates all sorts of stress. This is a very stressful situation to put a person into. It's also probably not the most positive situation to put family members into to where they would continue to operate and want to function as a family together. So this is something to where, again, we go back to what I talked about at the start. We start thinking about how to put the farm succession plan together and talk to people. There are ways to do this. And I think we get into that on the next slide. 
Yep. What could Henry and Alice have done differently? Not to berate the dead and criticize them, but there this and it's not just their fault. This happens to a lot of families. And you can type it in the chat box. Um, if you want to, you know, what do you think they should have done differently? You know, at no point have I ever mentioned that they communicated with their family members, right? Yeah, they could have made provisions for the child who lived there. They could have talked to their kids. They could have done a lot of things. There's a lot of solutions that they could have done differently. The biggest one they could have done was just sit down and go, at the very start when they developed the plan would be like, hey, do you want us, is anybody thinking about coming back to farm? We noticed it's within two years. So that may have been a nugget of a thought in 95 for the one daughter that she was coming back, or it may have been a last minute deal. The point is here is they never thought about updating their plan. You created a perfect plan in 1995. The situation changed in 1997. We're sort of dealing with that every day, right? We deal with a new normal every day. So once we have a plan, we really have a plan for that day. It may work for a year, it may work for two years, but we got to think about, okay, now we got to update the plan. That plan worked in 95 probably. It didn't work from 97 on. And at that point, they probably should have started communicating and changing the plan. But they had it set up fairly for their kids. They didn't have it set up equally. So, or they had it set up equally. They didn't have it set up fairly. They needed to think about how to do it fairly in 97. And you typing in the chat box is exactly what they should have done. They should have started thinking about how could they have done this to where it was fairly? How could they have done it? There are ways that we could have used a business entity to set it up where, you know, the two non-farm kids now have just some sort of participation rights and potentially get profits. They get part of the rent off the land. They get something. What if the one brother who's throwing this fit is just doing it because he just wanted the farm and his maddest sister got it? We don't know. We don't know what type of family grudges are held. I have no idea. This is a court opinion. Courts don't really get into emotions. They just give us facts. And they don't really, and it's very limited facts. It's never very clear facts. So there's a lot of issues not always appearing on those. So I need to give you the um, final outcome of all this is, so the court appoints referees that take into account potential improvements to the farm and the potential harm to selling the air. One thing I neglected to point out is in those long-term leases, it was agreed upon by the parents and the kid on the farm that any capital improvement she made, that was discounted against the eventual purchase price if she actually tried to purchase the land from the trust down the road. Um, and that there would be potential harm in selling the farm at fair market value to the farm here. This was something the court, I believe it was in Wisconsin, could actually take into account that the referee said, no, you can't actually sell this farmland out from under this air because if you do that, you're forcing them to move, you know? And all of this, none of us have ever brought up the fact that this is the only place this person has lived and we are forcing them to potentially sell their home. Not only are we kicking them out of their job, we may be kicking them out of their house if they aren't the one that can buy the property at the highest fair market value. Now, things could have been done to make sure they stay in the home, but there still would have been issues. In the end, the Court um, of Appeals, if I remember correctly, this is because the court actually didn't listen to any of this. It actually had to be appealed to do this. The court required the heir to pay, you know, basically a half million dollars or one third of the value of the farmland to the two non-farm heirs. Any problem with that so far? The question is, that never comes up in any of this that I haven't seen yet, it's sort of going back to this, is can they actually get a loan to buy that land or pay that off? Can they set it up? Can they structure it in a way that they can actually do it? I have a student and we're Taking this, um, we're working on a model that was developed at Oklahoma State um, with Shannon Farrell and some other um, 
faculty there to look at how, if you actually are in this situation, does it make sense for this to happen and where we can plug in some Maryland farm numbers and sort of develop this idea to show that, well, maybe if we do this, we're actually, the farm's going to fail. And almost, you know, if we run this simulation so many times, the farm's going to potentially fail because there's not enough capital and not enough money coming into the operation to sort of make it work. What's the better plan? I think I have that on the next one. Kind of already mentioned this, what the better plan is. I won't ask you to type this into the chat, you know, because you've already kind of done this. You know, when farm air and family return, go back to my point in 1995, we should have done this. They could have revoked a trust. It was a revocable trust. They could do away with it at any point during their lifetime. Oh, I see a question. They were, the question was, why were they um, required to pay two thirds of the value? Why wouldn't they be, they were required to pay two thirds of the value. I may have not said that properly. They were required to pay two thirds of the value. That half million dollar figure was one third of one third value. So they would have paid a million dollars out total to the two heirs. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Um, Henry and Alice could have revoked a trust. They had the ability to do that up until their deaths. They could have set up one to two business entities. This is just one solution. This is not the only solution to this problem. There are lots of solutions to this. They could have set up two business entities, either an LLC or a corporation, depending on which they were better at managing. Henry and Alice and Farm Air could have been given management responsibilities plus participation in profits. In one, one LLC or both LLCs, just depending on the number we create. The reason we might create two is we can set the farm up in one and then all the land up in another one and create some more asset protection, just depending on the situation. Off farm members, off farm heirs, we could have just been main members of it. And all they would have had the right, they had no management responsibility, they would just participate in any profits that were developed. The lands leased um, through two LLCs, we would set up long term leases with fair rental rates. They would get part of that. This is one solution. We've now taken away the problem of not having enough capital and everything not really working out fair in the moment. Now we're spreading that fairness out potentially to where it could potentially be more fair. There's still issues potentially with this solution. And as Ron is pointing out, he loves riddles. This is just one solution. There's a lot of other solutions to this riddle that make it fair. It just depends on what works for the families, the family members, everybody's goals and dreams and aspirations that we need to take into account. So the better plan is, this almost always is, let's start talking to who the heirs are. Let's think about what they want. Let's figure out what solution is going to work best for them. Then we need to make sure that whatever plan we think is best is going to work with that. And is it going to potentially be unfair to the on-farm heir? If it's unfair to the on-farm heir, then maybe we need to rethink it and figure out a way that's fair to the on-farm heir, but still fair and, and equitable in some way to the off-farm heirs. We can't just throw the off-farm heirs under the bus. We do have to think about how to be fair to them in some way. And by listening to this, if we go back to my earlier here, maybe all they want is the ability to participate in the farm in some way. They just want to be a part of the farm. And by doing this, we've made them happy and they'll you know, be easy to deal with. And we've sort of put them in a way to where we can't, they can't cause problems. I often point this out in estate planning workshops. The parents in the room know their children. They know the children that will be problems. They know the children and what they typically will do to cause problems. Your job is to figure out in the plan, have I contained that child potentially enough to where I've stopped some of the problems? We can't think that everybody's always going to be happy and sunshiny and we're all gonna run down the street singing hand in hand. We do have to think about how to manage problems as they could exist 
And we're not going to manage every problem. That's why these plans can be ever evolving. In 95, they didn't plan for the problem of a kid coming back. And then they never decided to deal with the white elephant. They just left it alone. So communication is key in all of this. The legal part is easy. Once we know what the goals are, and everybody's talked and we brought everybody in a room together and we kind of figured out what we want done. It's really easy to figure out the tools after that. We can make anything work after that. The hard part is almost always getting people to talk. And there are mediation programs, other things out there that can help you with that. If you have questions, my contact info at the end and I can put you in touch with them. And um, I'll go ahead and let you type any questions you might have. I'll move the chat box over to the other screen so I can see it. So what questions do you guys have on this nice, sunny Wednesday afternoon? I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Seeing no questions, Shannon. I'm going to give people a couple more seconds to type them in. But I think the next webinar is on April 22nd, if I'm doing the math correctly. And I remember from the email correctly. Yes, and it's on senior years, I think. Jesse and Maria are speaking. Okay, yeah, well, that one will be good too. So, um, oh, I see one question for a new startup farm with an LLC that have three heirs. Where is the first place to start? Asking the grown heirs if they want to be. Yeah, that's one place to start. The other way to do it easily is just. Um, call a family meeting and just say, you know, we're going to sit down on this day and we're going to talk about the farm and the future of the farm. Um, and, you know, be available. You, as the kind of the person dictating it, can sit down who can be in the room. It may just be your children. It may be your children and their spouses. It may be your children their spouses and um, um, grandkids, you dictate who that is, but it should typically be based around um, how involved people are in the farm and other issues um, like that. So that's one way to start. Um, the other question I see that's been written, and I think this is our last question is, for estate planning, do you need an accountant and an attorney? You need both. I mean, almost all situations. Um, typically, if you don't know an attorney and you're working with an accountant, they may know who they work best. With. Your accountant may know who they work best with. Um, you can do. You can start there. Um, I forgot to share with Shannon, but I'll send it to her next. I put together a fact sheet at one point within the past year, looking at how to interview an attorney, and. Um, that will help you at least find one that you're comfortable working with, but usually need both, um, mainly because the accountant's going to know the uh, uh, tax planning a little bit better than the attorney will. There are some attorneys that do have a tax background and can do it fairly well, but in a lot of cases, um, some attorneys do not do that well, and it would be good to just have on your team those people you can rely on. You may also need to reach out to other folks to help with this process. It may not just be the account. And you may have a financial planner involved, um, insurance agents, other people may be involved too, especially if we start looking at life insurance. And I've rambled long enough that I haven't seen any more questions. So um, I will thank you guys for attending today and hopefully you will sign up for the April 22nd webinar. And Enjoy, guys.
I see one that says, yeah, we could do that. We definitely could do an LLC versus corporation.